Hello, welcome to the Red Brick Sport Podcast. We're back and I've got a multitude of guests this week, so I'm not going to even bother introducing them. Let's just jump straight in to the Liverpool 3, Arsenal 1. Alex Alton. Hi. Tell me why Arsene Wenger left Alexis Sanchez out of his starting 11. Um, I've heard various rumours about this. Um, I think it's mostly uh, to do with some sort of training ground bust up. Um, basically Sanchez saying that he isn't really committed to Arsenal anymore probably down to the lack of success at the moment um, but I think to be honest there's a, there's a picture that's been going around on Twitter at the moment of um, Sanchez has thrown his gloves on the pitch after that 3-3 at Bournemouth um, and someone predicted that's where it started and I feel like that's a little bit more appropriate it's more on Sanchez's end he wants to leave can someone else tell me how Liverpool can go from losing to Leicester to beating Arsenal so easily? Because they're like they've got a very good record against the top six, and they they haven't, they haven't lost against any of the top six. So it seems Klopp knows how to step it up for the big game. All that narrative. But yeah, like everyone knows. I don't think many people believe Liverpool will actually finish in top four. You know, and being Arsenal doesn't change that. Because you know when, when they go away to like I don't, know, I don't know when they're playing next week. Say they play Middlesbrough away, you can see Middlesbrough like getting a draw out of them. Interesting that their next game is actually Burnley at home. So there's a nice parallel with the beginning of the season where what happened. Huh? Yeah, so where they lost to Burnley after being Arsenal the first day. So, yeah. yeah, maybe the same will happen again. Maybe it will. Um, and it seems like Liverpool are very inconsistent. Um, either their attacking unit is operating smoothly or it isn't and I think that is probably the reason they're not going to get top four Conrad you're a Liverpool fan yeah did you watch this game I watched the last half an hour so we defended pretty well I thought I was surprised by how well we were defending in that game but I don't think it means much I think we will do better in the second half season than we've done so far in the year because we have everyone's back now and that's the big problem that Liverpool have no depth in their squad. Um, so I still think top four is a possibility. Okay. But it would require Arsenal to slip up again. And Man United to slip up again. Let's hark back quickly to the Alexis Sanchez issue, if we may. Um, does anyone else think that if you're punishing Alexis Sanchez for this rumoured kind of trouble making in the dressing room? You would just leave him out entirely of the match day squad, not bring him on at half time. I think that shows how much he actually means to Arsenal. That even if he's causing trouble, he still has to be on the bench. Um, possibly could have changed the game for us. Um, but yeah, I do think he's a, he is such a pivotal player for Arsenal. I don't think even if I know obviously Wenger's got to leave him out in that circumstance if what is <coughs> said is actually true. Um, but yeah, he's so important. The thing is, there's a big div- obviously there was the Wenger out, Wenger in. That's been going on for years now. Yeah. But like the next few weeks will be a who do you prioritize? Who do you um, side with? Is it Wenger or Sanchez? But to be yeah. honest, with Sanchez, it's like I sort of can see from his point of view if his if he's been missing training or he, he skipped that session because he's frustrated with the lack of like um, the winning mentality of the team. Then there's something to be said that you know, to be honest, fans are probably understand Sanchez more than they understand Wenger oh, yeah. and the rest of the exactly. team. He's the one who wants to win. There's a reason he's missing yeah. training and being a nuisance. It's because he really wants to win. Yeah. You know, He's urging for a move because he wants to go for a team that wins things, and that's fair enough. Yeah. I mean, the, the other way of looking at this is from purely a results business type of way. And, I mean, Leicester proved that one of the ways to get Liverpool struggling defensively is to just play direct ground through balls to a pacey forward, which Alexis Sanchez very easily could have been in that game. Do we not think that would have been a viable strategy rather than Olivier Giroud? No, not necessarily. I think him playing Giroud isn't the fault. I think the fault is that he played Iwobi instead or whoever else was on the wing because they could have, Sanchez could have done a far better job than them. He's, he's been playing up front recently, but it's not like he can't play on the wing. I think playing Giroud is actually quite a good tactic against Liverpool. 
against their two centre backs. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I just think obviously Sanchez is better than the other options and probably obviously would have helped them out. But I don't know if they still would have won. I think Liverpool were actually fantastic in the first half. So uh, I'm not sure it would have made that much difference. But well, like Liverpool's first goal was from like we talk about Liverpool's like flow and attacking and you know threat, but their first goal was from a goal kick. But um, Minley get it up and then flick on and then boom, they like score goal. So um, I don't know. I don't know whether you should criticise Arsenal for that or I don't know. It's it's a weird one. It's still slick attacking football. I know that the, their first goal was direct, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. throughout the game they do they do a range of different attacks and it's just bombardment really. That first half was just ruthless attacking non-stop and. Um, Full credit to them for that, to be honest. Yeah. I think what it does is quite conveniently deflect from Wenger's increasingly obvious incapabilities as a manager. Because I think this training ground struggle is quite a good cover for the fact that he's really struggled to win two big games now um, in a short space of time. Let's move on, Nathan. To your beloved Manchester United. Mm. I'm reading right now that both Zlatan Ibrahimovic and Tyrone Mings have been charged by the FA. They have. Uh, for violent conduct. Do you want to quickly run through what happened between those two before we talk about your opinions of the game? Okay, well, for those that missed it, uh, Mings and Ibrahimovic were involved in a, a small battle, let's say, in which it started with uh, a good tackle on Rooney by Mings, but Following that, he seemed to, well, accidentally, not accidentally, not accidentally, not sure, stamp on Ibrahimovic's head. And only a couple of minutes later, uh, Ibra got his revenge from a corner and deliberately elbowed Mings in the face. And they both got away with it, and instead, Andrew Sermon was sent off. So, uh, the charge has come since, because the referee missed the incident, and we will see what that charge comes to. Apparently, Mings is going to be getting a lengthier ban. Really? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's what it said. The FA, states, the FA statement release said if found guilty, obviously the case of Mings is more severe or deserves of more than a three game ban. Well well let's open this up. Let's open this up to wow. the group. So Nathan said that the Mings incident is not necessarily as clear cut, deliberate as the Zlatan one. So, what are people's opinions on whether Mings meant it or not, and what well, the what the band? Mings definitely like meant something. He didn't mean to sort of stamp on his head and like you know. He can just tell sort of in the moment as he was jumping over, he sort of sensed an opportunity, and sort of. I think someone said before that they tried. He tried to land his foot as close as he was head as he could, but he actually sort of picked up the top. Whereas Ebers, it was definitely sort of planned. He sort of he knew who he was. Thought right before the corner came in, probably he was thinking, Right, I'm gonna get my elbow in his face. So, you, you could argue from that that Ebers is worth because it's sort of um, like pre planned, pre planned, yeah. yeah. Alex, you yeah. were nodding about Mings's disagreement. You don't, oh, yeah, no, I, don't, I think it's completely accidental, mm. honestly. I would, but I think it was. Have you heard what Carragher said? And I agree with this. No, if it is completely accidental, you have. You know you but you know you've stamped on someone even if it was accidental. Yeah. You'd have stopped then or you'd have stopped after the ball had gone out of play and checked on if he's okay or said something. You you yeah. he will have known his boot was contacted somewhere on Ibrahimovic. I don't know where he may have thought he'd contacted him, body, head, but he knows he's contacted him somewhere. And there was no remorse, there was no you know, slight No, I can get that. And yeah. if you've stamped on someone or touched you would think oh, are you okay? Yeah. And that's why I think I think it may have been deliberate really. I think purely from you know, from my point of view, if that happened, obviously if that happened to me in a football match, I'd be really annoyed. <coughs> but I can see, like when it happened, I was watching it live, and I was like, "That's completely accidental." Just the way he's jumping, and the way he's not actually focused on what he's doing, he's looking away, he's looking to his left because the he just acknowledged on his left. He was present there. Well, he has to. There's two men on he, the floor. He sees front. him there. I'm not saying he's done. I'm not saying he's done it deliberately, but. There's something in what Carragher said, which is definitely you know you've made contact with someone and close to where the head is. You would show some form of concern or remorse for having done that, and there was none of that. There was, this was the deliberate battle between the two of them that had raged from the fifth minute onwards. 
Could so, you argue that that is because of Ibra's presence, that he didn't actually want to go and apologise to him because he thought he'd get more than he bargained for? Same reason people were saying about the referee, saying that he, he was too scared to send Ibra off. Bit of a conspiracy. I could de- no, I can definitely see by the referee, actually, when, when they were talking to each other, he's literally, Ibra's just towering over them. Yeah. But... There's definitely no, Mings wasn't Mings wasn't afraid of him. The two of them were at each other, and that's why I think there's definitely something in it being deliberate. There really is. So uh, let's talk about bands. Then, what sort of band do you think we can expect uh, versus what is probably the right kind of band for each of the players? Well, it'll be three games for Ibra because the elbows are standard things that yep. are retrospectively looked at. So it'll be three games for Mings. Don't know. They might. It has to be a unanimous decision between the three referees. So one of them could say they don't think it's deliberate and he won't get punished at all. If all three say it's deliberate, then could be looking at between three and six. I don't think it's going to be more than six. Yeah, more than six is like outrageous. Yeah, excessive. Yeah, Bakuna got six, didn't he? That was stupid. Yeah, but like, if it was on a plan, I don't know if people listening like know what this is, but basically Bakuna last Saturday in Villa versus Derby, at the end of the game, um, the linesman made a decision that Bakuna disagreed with and he ran over to him and in the process sort of literally made contact with the linesman and it kind of looked that the word, head, well, basically the word headbutt was thrown around, but it wasn't really a headbutt. But the point is, if he did the same thing to a player, it, wouldn't, it wasn't a sending off and he got six games for it. Yeah. Um, so it just shows that like, you know, some of these bands there longer than you think. All right. Um, away from the actual incidents within the game, what did you think of Man United's performance, Nathan? Really, you need to be beating Bournemouth if you want to be challenging with the top teams. Yeah, it's just... Uh, well, it's very familiar, this. The sort of lack of ruthlessness, won't take off chances at home, just keep drawing. We've drawn more at home than we've won this season, which is obviously not good enough for a team you know, trying to challenge for the title no matter top four. So, can't really condone that. Again, we've struggled against 10 men. We had this earlier in the year against Burnley at home. I don't know what it was. It's like, maybe we came out second half thinking we're definitely going to win, we're going to cruise. We had two chances, and one of them was obviously a missed penalty, which is a shame. But, you know, apart from that, we really didn't create much in the second half. Bournemouth came out to defend, which is fair enough, down to 10 men. But, apart from a few chances in the first half, like, just keep missing chances, keep... Pogba, unfortunately, was... Slated Ball quite play. heavily, yeah. and it, it, did, it doesn't look good for him with those chances at the end. But he has one good game, he has one bad game. I wasn't expecting miracles from him first season. It's a shame the price tag is banded about for every shot he misses, for every pass he misplaces. But that's what he has to deal with, and in time I think it will come good. But it is very frustrating now at home when you just think, OK, we'll win today. And then we just drop more points, and it's a never-ending story at the moment. But hey, if we win the Europa League, it doesn't really matter. Well, let's move on to Tottenham Everton, which was an interesting game, made even more interesting by the uh, two injury time goals, um, which didn't really change the result, but were bizarre. Um, not quite as bizarre as Harry Kane and Deli Ali's handshake. Did anyone see this? Did indeed, yeah. Yeah, and that's almost as extravagant as the jingle we have at the beginning of this uh, podcast. Um, Harry Kane versus Romelu Lukaku is basically the big story from this game. Uh, Kane came out on top with obviously two goals to Lukaku's one. Is he the best striker in the Premier League? No. Yes. Yes. Okay, Probably. Harry, tell me why not. Because Aguero is. Okay. But Aguero would expose his team and he would score mm. I don't know. I don't think he would. I'm not sure. I, I'd have Lukaku in my team over Kane as well. I suppose that's a different question. You're wrong with it. I, I, as an Arsenal fan, I would give so much to have Harry Kane in Arsenal's team. He's, as would I with United. He's, he's, well, he probably will end up at United. I hope so, yeah. He believes, <laughs> and then he'll go on to break the Premier League goal scorers. Beside the point, the last three seasons now. So he's on, I think he's approaching 70 league goals. So he'll be near that soon. Um and I just know just the way he plays he seems to find space he's one of those strikers who can find space so easily score so easily he scores at will I mean you could say that he's just racking up his goals in games like I get a Patrick against Watford for example but I do when I watch him I just because you look at him you're just like you're not that good are you really mate but then the way he plays for Spurs is just it's fantastic 
He's got so many goals. It's weird. Sometimes he does basic things wrong, like he'll he'll miscontrol balls a lot of them, but then he'll go and score. So yeah. Goals. So it doesn't matter. It's quite weird. I've not seen a player like him for that yeah. for a very long time that can score at will. I've maintained for a while that he really is echoing Alan Shearer, and I know yeah. that's a big statement. No, to, you can make the comparison. So but it, it yeah. is. It's like a. He's not fast yet. He seems fast because of his power and yeah. this something about him. He just he's just always scores. Then that's obviously why I think he'd be a future United signing for sure. World transfer record, possibly. Mm, don't know about that. What, above ninety million. Spurs, you know, Spurs would take it. I think. Yeah. I think definitely. Spurs love a good transfer deal. What about Lukaku then? He had one chance and he scored. Yeah, Quite which is interestingly, I'd say the opposite of what a lot of the criticism of him versus Kane would have been is that Kane is consistently good at scoring, <laughs> slightly better at hold up play, I'd argue. Whereas Lukaku goes through patches of yeah. you wonder what he's really doing in a game, and then yeah, other games amazing. he's unplayable. Yeah, he's got really bad first touch at times, Lukaku. Mm. That'd be one my one observation of him. Uh, like you said, he can be on his day. Probably one of the, be- the best players in the league, and then he can also look bang average the next week. So he's got to find that. I mean, he has found consistency this season. But if we're going to say he's better than Kane, you know, there's a reason Kane's been top scorer the last two seasons. And probably will be this season as well. Because yeah. Kane, oh, sorry. sorry. Then you always say about how what look at the players Kane's got surrounding. You know, he's got Alley, Ericsson, yeah. sort of feeding him. When he, when he compared to Everton, obviously, like it's good players at Everton, but, but they really were for Harry Kane in mm-hmm. that team, didn't they? Really, everything builds up to Kane. Mm-hmm. We could argue that with Lukaku as well, yeah. But it's sort of it's more like give the ball to him and make him make something happen rather than whereas Spurs is like you know mm-hmm. a lot of it's centre yeah. by Kane, to, you yeah. Know, put the cherry. In. No, it's, oh. it's a fair enough point, but I also think you got to take into account Kane's goal score record this year. How the fact he was out for two months, which is even more incredible. Like he was out for October, November, didn't come back. When he started, I think he was on two Premier League goals, whilst Costa was on nine. I think that's the start of it or something like that when he started. And the run's been incredible. It's not just Kane, obviously, you say Ali Ericsson, they all contribute, but they've been very impressive in the last few last few weeks. The thing months. that was um, said in commentary that I found really interesting about Ericsson is that he, before this weekend, I'm not sure if it's still the case, but he covered more ground than any other player in the Premier League. Which is not a side mm. of your game of his game that you really associate him with. No. But I just so he thought plays in more advanced roles, usually associated yeah. with midfield destroyers like Kante, Gay this season. Yeah. Exactly. I thought it was an interesting yeah. one. And probably sums up the attitude that Pochettino's got in the time yeah. players given. Um, the only other narrative that came out of this game was the battle of the managers linked with the Barcelona job. <laughs> um Pochettino is obviously a weird one given the Espanol link um, and that I think he grew up as a Real Madrid fan so I don't think Barcelona fans would have forget that very quickly mm. but what about Ronald Koeman for the Barcelona job? Does anyone see that happening now? There's more connections obviously Koeman had a very good career at Barca and I think I think he was quite for quite a while a club ambassador as well um, I don't, I don't Personally, I think there's way better options in Spain available. I don't think Adam Koeman's proved himself at Southampton. Does that mean he can go and manage Barca? I don't think it does, no. Um, yeah, I, I, I can see why bookies would make that observation. It's quite understandable, but I don't think he will be the manager next season, no. They love employing former players, though. That's the, I guess that's the yeah. big connection. Yeah. Because, I mean, I watched Football Gold, just a random thing <laughs> this weekend. It was just uh, Barcelona against Valencia. And it was uh, a younger Guardiola, Luis Enrique in the team. And I was just looking for the rest of the team to see well, who's going to be the next manager. Because, yeah. you know, well, they do like Potentially Xavi. Xavi and Iniesta come back. Yeah. And it's, uh, That'd be interesting. Yeah. All right. Um, we'll take a break and we'll come back and discuss the rest of the Premier League results. <laughs> Right, we're back. 
Um, let's talk about Man City because they completed a fairly routine win uh, away at Sunderland and set what Goal.com described as a curious club record, um, which because they got their fifth consecutive clean sheet away from home in all competitions for the first time ever. Um, this was a team that was kind of struggling for clean sheets earlier on in the season, um, but they're looking like they're kind of getting to grips with Pep Guardiola's ideas and maybe a force for next season, anyway? Maybe even this season. <laughs> Who knows? I think that the way Pep um, celebrated the end of the game, I think you could maybe say that he didn't think the title race was over. Um, probably is, but anything can happen in football. Yeah. Um, another positive from this game, I thought, from City perspective, is that Leroy Sané looks like a a very impressive young player, and I think I'm starting to see why they spent so much money on him. Um, does anyone else see him kind of becoming a player that Pep builds around? Um, I think, yeah, the potential's been there for quite a while. Obviously scored that goal for Schalke at Real Madrid two years ago now. Um, I think when he came to the Premier League, I think people thought he was pretty much all pace, no technique. I think he's slowly Navas Mark Two. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Um and I think he's proven slowly that he's actually got quite a lot of technique. Um coupled with pace. So I think yeah, he could be a very, very decent player for City in the future. Yeah. What about Aguero? What do you think his future holds? Is he gonna stay at City? Because obviously Gabriel Jesus being out means that he is getting back in the team. Um but is it Perhaps healthy competition between him and Jesus, or do you think he'll want to move on in the summer? I thought he was being linked to uh, Real Madrid on Twitter, but mm-hmm. how far do you trust Twitter is the question. But I don't know. I think he's still one of the best strikers in the league, realistically. Probably the best. Him and Kane, yeah. I'd say. But I don't know. He's, he sort of gets injured too much. I can definitely see him moving on. Like he's come out in the past three years, he's come out with some very sort of cryptic quotes about his future, and I think he's sort of manoeuvring himself to be able to move on if he really wants to at the end of this season. The other side of this is obviously Sunderland, who are really struggling. Um, can anyone see Moyes keeping them up? No, no. I don't think so. No. Please close. <laughs> Excellent. Down. Well, there you go. Yeah. They're just bad, aren't they? They're, they're There's only so long you can cling on. Yeah, and they've, they've literally their they're saving grace is Defoe, and yeah. that isn't enough to keep you up. And the rest of the team is pretty shocking, to be honest. They're the only way I can put it, and they're just not Premier League standard. I would have liked to have seen Allardyce had a full season, and it would because I, I think they would have stayed up if they'd had him from the start. And obviously, that England acrimony happened, but no, it's all gone quite downhill once again. I just can't see him staying up this time. All right. Um, let's move on to Chelsea, who increasingly look like they will win the league, um, and further that with a two-one win away at West Ham uh, last night. So this wasn't quite as easy as normal, um, and I think Slaven Bullet said afterwards that they're so good that you you have to make mistakes to beat them, not the other way round, which was a perplexing comment. Um, but Hazard and Costa both scored in this one. Classic Chelsea win, really, other than no clean sheet. Um, is anyone going to catch them? Like I said, I think the only team... This would require Chelsea really falling off and City winning pretty much every game until the end of the season. I think City are the only team that can. Um, Not Spurs? I don't see Spurs can do because I think I think City have got the potential to win yeah. like all but two games. Okay. I don't think Spurs do. I think Spurs have got quite a few draws in them left. Yeah. Um, honestly, I think to be honest, you'd be a fool not to back Chelsea for the title now. Yeah. I mean, they're evidently strong favourites. I mean, everyone expects yeah. them to go win it now. That's that's fair enough. But I wouldn't write it off as being over yet, just because they still will play at Stamford Bridge, City and Chelsea. That is, and mm-hmm. let's say City were to win that game. That means there's five points between them if they City win the yeah. game in hand. And five points could mean Chelsea just slip up one, one place, one defeat, and, yeah. it, and you know it's back on. But obviously, as it stands, the way they're just sort of going about their business, they're doing win after win very efficiently, so can't really look past them. Uh, what about Conte as 
a manager in the Premier League? Because a lot of people weren't quite sure whether he'd be able to step straight in and impose his philosophy. But obviously, that seems to have happened after a few games at the beginning. Um, and he seems incredibly good at adapting to whatever situation he needs, um, even if that is from kickoff rolling the ball back to David Luiz, who plays a 70 yard pass to Pedro, who's behind the defence. Um, but didn't quite come off in this game, but it just seems to be an example of how he is a tactically fairly impressive manager. What are people's thoughts on the yeah, contact? I'd say definitely like, I think the, the whole 3 4 3 formation has come about kind of as a mistake. Um, obviously, he played with it in Italy, but um, who would have thought playing Victor Moses at right midfield would have worked? Who would have thought that David Luiz, whose career in England was already pretty much written off, um, would work? Who thought Marcos Alonso uh, would come back and do so well? I don't, yeah, I mean, he's done. I mean, ideally, he would have liked to get in players like Bonucci rather than David Luiz, and has managed to almost coast the league. Yeah. With players of that calibre, which is in- incredibly impressive. When you think back to where they were when they lost to Arsenal, was it October? I think it was October yeah. when they lost 3-0. I mean, I'd like to see what the pundit said after that game, but I assume a lot of them probably wrote them off at that point, which is fair enough. They were eight points behind at that stage. I know that's nothing in the grand scheme of things, but they weren't looking mightily impressive. Changed the formation. These players, as Alex says, you, would, you wouldn't pick them yourself, but yet they fit the system perfectly and you know improve so much week in, week out. Hmm. Right, PFA Player of the Year is something that I'd like to bring up in relation to Chelsea because it seems like a lot of the candidates might be coming from their team. Um, someone said to me in a WhatsApp group chat last night that Victor Moses should win Player of the Year, and I laughed in his face um, and said, look at N'Golo Kante. Does anyone have any different thoughts? Don't, I honestly don't think you can look past... Kante now. Um, I think he's proved, he's proved his worth twice. And if we're looking at the whole year of 2016, then, or if it's the season, this season anyway, either either one you pick, he's still by far and away the best player on form that Elite had. Um, you could possibly pick maybe like Harry Kane, but I think that would be quite unfair on Kante. Hmm. And certainly not Victor Moses. What about Eden Hazard? Um, well, I think Raheem Sterling's having a pretty similar season in terms of stats. So, you know, no one's shouting Sterling for it, are they? So, hmm. this is another quick thing. Did anyone see Mikel Antonio working in the club shop? For, uh, <laughs> because he was suspended, so he was printing a number thirty shirt in the club shop before the game. Can I see that? <laughs> Karen, Karen Brady getting the best of the players on and off the field. So we think Chelsea are probably going to win the league. What about the rest of the table, top four? Who else do we think is going to make it into that? Um, I think regardless of the weekend's result, I still think to Arsenal will make the top four. Probably in fourth. Um, and City and Spurs are left to fight out the remaining two spots. Surprise, you think that. No, I don't know. Spurs, Spurs. No, no, no the Arsenal bit. The Arsenal. Oh, what? I was think... finishing fourth. Yeah, yeah. No. I just, I got this creeping feeling. It comes around every single March. No matter how many people doubt Arsenal, no matter how many people say it's not going to happen, it, it always will does. actually. Yeah. And we always pick up because we'll pick up like enough wins to get in the top four. But you still, you still got games. Who like a tough team to play? You still got Spurs away, United yeah. at home. Is that was that? Sydney got City as well coming up, don't you? Yeah, I probably uh, think so. yeah. We have. I don't You've got three, I think you've got three yeah. tough games left. I think we've got something similar. Um, yeah. It's so hard to call because every week it changes. Every week we have a good opportunity to move out of sixth, which is just the dreaded position. But we seem to mess it up every single week, and it is becoming very frustrating. Um, I don't. I really don't know how to call it because between the three, United, Liverpool, Arsenal, we could all drop points anywhere. Unfortunately, with our inconsistencies, yeah. you can just see us dropping points anywhere. It's too hard to call, but you definitely think that Tottenham and City would have enough to get in. And then yeah. in between three for one spot. No love for Liverpool in the top four? No. They have quite Defensively a good, quite a good run yeah. yeah, They lose against poor teams. And it doesn't matter if you beat the best teams in the league, they lose losing to the worst ones. Although I finally think Klopp's well. made the right decision in 
putting Clav on in rather than Lucas. Like Lucas, I mean, Clav might be a brilliant centre back, but Lucas is just so not a centre back. You know, they lost yeah. to Leicester with Lucas centre, and he's not at fault for yeah. every goal. It's not just his fault, but it, it's not someone you want at centre back, and people to try and take him on because they know he's not comfortable there. At least Clavon's meant to be a centre back. Mm. The only other game we should probably touch on is Swansea Burnley, purely for the bizarre refereeing incident that um, occurred in this game. Did anyone see what happened with this penalty decision? Yes. Mm-hmm. Tell me about it, Nathan. Uh, someone sent it across who I can't remember. This is for Swansea. It was, yep. a, was a corner? I'm not sure exactly, but it was a Swansea and Burnley player both challenging for the ball and it hit someone's hand. It turns out it was... Sorry, it was a Burnley cross, wasn't it? It turns out it actually hit Sam Vokes' hand, mm. and yet the penalty was still given to Burnley, despite the mm. fact it hit his hand. Obviously, the referee saw the ball hit a player's arm, mm. thought, well, it was a Swansea player, and gave the penalty, which was quite a criminal decision. But if he's seen that somehow, obviously in the melee of players, it's kind of hard to, hard to spot, really. A lot came of... Anthony Taylor's trip to Marbella um, <laughs> for this game, um, which I think was brilliantly responded to by Sean Dyche, who said, it doesn't really matter what he does on his days off, no carbs before Marbs, something like that, um, which was a great, because I think that's the perfect response from a manager. Yeah. Um, but do we think that a referee should be going to Marbella a few days before refereeing a Premier League game? Or do we think that he has rights to do whatever he wants in his time off. Well, it depends if it's, if it's going to affect his performance so much. I don't think you can necessarily link him going to Marbella in the week before that game and him making an honest mistake. I think you can link yeah. them, but there's no. I don't think there's much of a relationship between, <laughs> between the two. Let's be honest, if he didn't make those mistakes, he also made a mistake for the final goal, in my opinion. Lorente did push... Mm. I don't know who the centre-back was, Ben Mee, maybe for the winning goal. Um, if he hadn't made one mistake or two mistakes, no one would even know when he's gone to Marbella. We really wouldn't know. So, yeah. And Kevin Friend, I think, was also there. So, <laughs> yeah. Potentially he could read something into that. <laughs> All right, that win pushed Swansea up to 16th. Um, now five points clear of the bottom three. So, let's look at the relegation zone. Currently, Sunderland bottom... Hull, Middlesbrough, and they've got Crystal Palace, Swansea, Leicester, Bournemouth, Watford. I say Bournemouth onwards, looking pretty shaky. Um, anyone got any relegation predictions for me? Probably finally now at the bottom. It's not been like this for a while, but the bottom three as it is yeah. looks quite solid for going down. Yeah, Middle. I think Middlesbrough and Sunderland. Middlesbrough can't pick up a win, mm. and even when they look played well, they get draw. They're so tame. Yeah. Um, no, if you start a really good stead. You're just going down. I feel, <laughs> there, but, um, I feel sorry for Hull because I think Marcus, yeah. had he been in from the start of the season, Hull would probably be sort of be 13th, 12th sort of position. Whoa. That's, no, that's I think they probably job. would. No, I don't, I'm not sure it would be that good, but they, they certainly improved under him. I'm not sure. It's not that many points difference. I think they would have picked up about four more wins under him had he been in from the start. Um, They're 10 points off 13th. It's Sunderland definitely can't see past. I can't see any way that Sunderland cannot go down this season. Finally, we do say that every year though, and I'm just thinking, are they are they going to provide some mm. ridiculous miracle? I remember last time we beat everyone just in a run of run of weeks. You just couldn't see happening, but I can't see them. <laughs> the bottom three looks quite short fire moan. Yeah, yeah. Leicester looking safe now. Their resurgence under mm. Shakespeare. Good. All right. Um, I'll just wrap up some of the other results from the weekend. Stoke managed a 2 0 home win over Middlesbrough, who were really struggling. That was a Mark Arnautovic brace. Um, Stoke are looking average mid table as usual. Uh, Leicester, 3 1 win at home to Hull. Pretty big result then. Um, and another example of them playing like they should be. Uh, and then Southampton. Nancy Southampton managed a 4-3 away win um, at Watford. Gabby Adini scoring again. Did you watch this game? I watched the highlights. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think it. of Southampton this season? Uh, overall, like not bad. Probably can't complain with the cup final and 
for a tenth of a minute. If we, if we finish like tenth or above, then probably be happy with that. Because mm-hmm. I didn't really fancy Puel to do much when he came in. But um, yeah, Gary Dini, obviously, great signing. Yeah, and that's his sixth be, goal in four games, Southampton. Yeah, it'd just be a case of like keeping hold of him or keeping him fit and happy for next season. Because, well. I'm expecting half the squad to disappear again, quite frankly, at the end of the season. Yeah, well, if you're listening to Watford striker Stefano Okaka, um, Gabbiadini should be going to Real Madrid at the end of this season. (laughs) That's Um, potentially a stretch. Yeah, (laughs) good prediction there. Elsewhere, Crystal Palace won away at West Brom, which is a good result for Palace, actually. Great goal from Townsend. Um, Yeah. Yeah. He was absolutely shattered. Yeah, he almost (laughs) passed out after that. Yeah, run basically from his own box. Um, yeah, so that's the Premier League wrapped up. We'll take another break, and then Nicola will round up the lower leagues for us. Right, uh, Nancy's going to round up the She Believes Cup action in women's football for us. Yeah, well. England won. Uh, they beat America 1 0. I think it was 87th minute. Uh, Ellen White with little scrappy toe folk, which was pretty impressive because uh, America are World Cup winners. So I, th- I think it's only the second time we've beaten them in something ridiculous like 34 years or 40 years. Um, and the last time was in 2011 at home. So it's the first time we've beaten them in America. Um, but they are still, they're still like pre season as well. So they're tinkering with in defence and playing out from the back and young players so whether you can actually take much from it is questionable but um and then England lost their first game against France in the 94th minute from a corner which was extremely painful to watch and probably for the players but they seem to bounce back quite quickly which is good so the last game is tonight uh, against Germany and I Fancy England might nick it, but we'll see. All right, thanks, Nancy. Um, lower leagues, Nicola, give us the action from all the leagues that aren't the Premier League. Well, most of them. Most of them. Um, in the Championship, Birmingham played at home on Friday night. They lost 3 1 um, against Leeds. Craig Gardner scored the goal. Um, both of the other West Midlands teams were away on Saturday. Villa won 2-0 at Rotherham, and Wolves lost 2-1 at Reading. Um, the, ta- the table now sees Villa in 13th on 45 points, Blues are 17th on 43 points, and Wolves are one point above the relegation zone in 23rd. In League One, uh, Walsall won 2-0, but it again, Walsall keep being involved in very silly games. Um, Oldham went down to nine men. So Lee Croft got sent off uh, for the, lati- the Latics in the 16th minute. They held out until Erhan uh, Otsuma scored a penalty uh, in the 71st minute. And then Oldham went down to nine men as Brian Wilson um, got sent off in the 84th minute. Before the final minutes of the game, um, Bakayoko fired in to see the result. They're in 12 from 49 points. Coventry have had an interesting weekend as ever. Um, their keeper saved a penalty to keep the scores level as they um, it was a nil nil draw with Shrewsbury. Um, but they're five points adrift at the bottom of the table. Uh, manager Russell Slade was sacked on Sunday and then on Monday Mark Robbins has been appointed who managed them in twenty twelve thirteen. And then Sully Hull drew away at Dover. They're in fourteenth, they've actually moved up in the table. All right, go Sully Hull. Um, thanks Nicola. That's all from the podcast um, and we'll be back next week.